Hi, I'm Jim Fruchterman, and I'm president of Benetech, Silicon Valley's deliberately nonprofit high tech company. I'm an engineer turned high tech entrepreneur, turned social entrepreneur, and what I want to tell you about is how technology can better serve humanity, how we can overcome market failure by using social enterprises to make better tools, information tools, for the nonprofit sector. I was at Caltech during the 70s. I was learning how to use technology. Um, I went to a class and we were taught about pattern recognition. And the example the professor used for what you did with pattern recognition is build a guided missile targeting system so that the missile would recognize its target, zoom in, and blow it up. And so I went, I went back to my dorm and I, I kind of wonder, I wonder if there's a more socially beneficial application of this technology because it's really cool technology. And, uh, and then it came to me, well, what if instead of recognizing tanks and the battlefield and blowing them up, what if, you, what if you could recognize letters and words and help blind people read? I know kind of how high-tech business works. And if it doesn't make a lot of money, it doesn't get a lot of attention from venture capitalists and major high-tech companies. That's just the way things are. And so when my venture capitalists vetoed an application of some technology that I had developed to actually helping disabled people, I thought, well, why don't I start a, a nonprofit tech company that doesn't have to make that much money and see if we could actually tackle this problem. So we became, uh, for quite a number of years, the leading maker of reading machines for the blind worldwide. And now we've moved into new areas using technology to solve different problems. So some of the areas that we're, we're working on, uh, probably our largest project is Bookshare. A uh, thumbnail sketch of Bookshare is Amazon meets Napster meets talking books to the blind, but legal. So Amazon, it's all online. You actually go to a web page and type in Harry Potter or Red Badge of Courage or High School Biology, and up pops all the books that you might want to you know, use. Uh, it's, it's kind of Napster in the sense that our library is often essentially developed by our users. So people with disabilities like blindness or severe dyslexia scan the books, parents, teachers scan the books. We add them to our collection, and they're available to everybody. The talking books for the blind part is that our books are actually digital text. They're like a word processor file. And because of the flexibility of text, you can push a button and it's braille. You can push a button, it's large print. You can push a button and it's digital audio. It actually will speak the book aloud to you. And so the goal of Bookshare is to turn inaccessible print books into books that are accessible to blind and print disabled people so they can actually use those books for education, employment, and social inclusion. Now Bookshare is up to more than 130,000 users worldwide and we're starting to serve people all over the world reading not only English but Spanish, Tamil and, and Hindi in India and we've just announced that we're doing Arabic. So that's our largest project. Uh, we're also a leading software developer for the human rights movement. Um, it turns out that the human rights movement is an information processing industry that no for-profit can figure out how to make any money on. So what we do is we develop tools, first for grassroots groups, to capture sort of the individual stories of human rights suffering. So someone comes in and says, you know, my son was detained by the police and they beat him up and they broke his leg. Well, that turns into our bulletin system and it actually captures it, backs it up outside the country securely, encrypts it, scrambles it so it can't be read by the government, and now that, that information is captured and now it can, it can go other places. It can be used to advocate in the press, it can be used to file a court case, it can be part of a larger pattern of abuse that we can actually use to try to change policies. And that's where the second half of our human rights program comes in. We're the leading guys working on truth commissions or war crimes tribunals. We're the technical people who take 50,000 witness testimonies and turn it into a story of who did what to whom that, that gives sort of the overall um, view of the patterns of violence. And that's really crucial. If you're trying to convict a former dictator, no one ever saw that former dictator actually pull the trigger and kill someone. Maybe they were just responsible for giving the orders that killed 10,000 or 100,000 people. Well, we try to help the prosecutors in those cases put together the, the sort of chain of, of command and the story about the crimes of policy that actually may lead to some of these convictions. And so it's, it's another example of where we see social enterprise sort of filling the gap where the market is going to fail. Here's a group of people who have tons of information. It's really, really important. 
but no one can make money off of them, that's where social enterprise like Benetech can come in. And our final area is in the environment. After hearing about what we did for the human rights movement, large environmental groups came to us and said, we've got a problem managing our environmental projects. Uh, we spend lots of money trying to accomplish really important environmental objectives, you know, saving fish species, getting rid of invasive species in wetlands, uh, making healthier forests, protecting the air, water quality, whatever it is. People want to actually do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. And how would you do that if you didn't have project management software, which no one will write for the environmental movement because they can't make money on it. So these groups came to us and said, well, we heard you wrote software for field people in the human rights movement. Can Benetech write software for the environmental movement? And so we kind of joke, we kind of call it TurboTax to the environmental practitioner. TurboTax is like the software that kind of guides you step by step through preparing your tax returns. Well, we do the same thing for that biologist or activist who's now in charge of a, of a significant project and they, they got to figure out how they're going to make a difference. So this isn't technology for its own sake. This is technology for social impact. And if you really care about making a difference as a technologist, you should be working on things that are really important. And what more important things are there than education, the environment, and human rights? I mean, we're just privileged to be able to work with the people on the front lines of these social issues and be the tool makers that actually help them get what they need to be successful and to do more of what works and less of what doesn't work or help convict the bad guy or get the accessible content they need. The common thread of all of these, all of these ventures is, a, is, is basically a focus on sustainability. Now, sustainability means a lot of different things to different people. What we want to do is make sure that this project can keep on delivering the social benefit. So we have to figure out how to piece together the money to keep this going. And so our definition of sustainability is that after a few years, all of these projects should stand on their own in terms of revenue. In other words, we should find a way to actually pay for this. And, and it's different in each area. I mean, in the books for the, for the blind and the print disabled, uh, we're now at the point where the government went, wow, this is, this is really cheaper than what we used to be doing. How about we just buy subscriptions to Bookshare for all American students with disabilities? So we've done that, and now Scandinavian countries have done the same thing, Australia, and we're working with schools and universities so that, you know, both in the developed world and the developing world, so people can get access to it. So now what that means is I don't have to go out and raise money every year to keep Bookshare going. We've actually found people who care enough about it to either to, to buy the service directly or to pay for other people to get the service, and that, that, that also means something cool. We're not distributing charity we're providing a service to customers. And so our users have much more power over us than if we were just being a charity and saying, here, here's some good stuff. I hope you're happy with it. Instead, they actually can make us accountable for, did you, did you get the book I needed for school? Uh, is, is, is it accurate? Can I go to page 137 when the teacher says go to page 137? So we're very sensitive to what our users say. So, so in the human rights field, well, you probably are not surprised. There's not a lot of money in the developing world, which is where a lot of the gigantic human rights violations are going on. So what I told the head of our human rights program, Patrick Ball, Patrick, you've got to figure out how 90% of the money to run this program is going to come from the third party payers for human rights. Because all money in the human rights field is coming from donors. So whether the donors give us the money directly or whether they give the money to human rights groups that pay us for services, as long as together those things pay for 90% of it, then we think that's pretty sustainable because I can raise from general donors to, 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 to my organization, Benetech, the extra 10% of the money. And our human rights program has done that five out of the last six years. And then in the environmental area, the environmental groups, the big environmental groups, pay 100% of what it costs to develop this software. And as a result, even though this software is open source and free, they're actually paying us because they recognize there's value to it. And so we got the environmental movement, the big play players paying us to develop the software, and then small activist groups essentially get it. Uh, you know, we say if you don't have a lot of money, you know, pay us $25 for, for a copy of the software. If you have more money, pay us a couple hundred dollars. And people, even though the software is free, you could make copies for free, people actually pay that because they want to see it sustainable. They want to see us two years from now making the new update that helps them solve environmental problems even better. Social entrepreneurs, the common thing is they may use the methods of business. Sometimes they can even break even from revenues or, or actually make even a slight profit. 
But the real goal is how do I make social good sustainable on a pervasive basis and do it at scale, whether it's in green energy, you know, social justice, jobs for people who have a hard time getting employed, making books for people with disabilities. These are terrific opportunities. And I know that in the heart of almost everyone, there are these great ideas for making social good. And my main message is, just because it doesn't make a lot of money is no reason not to do it. That's probably a double or a triple negative, but I think you get my flavor. It's, it's, there is a way to make it happen. We've got lots of great role models, social entrepreneurs out there making it happen today. So if you have a great idea for how to do social good, figure out a way to find the money and make it happen. The world needs it. So I'm Jim Fruchterman, the president of Benetech, Silicon Valley's deliberately nonprofit high-tech company, and I've really enjoyed telling you about social enterprise and technology serving humanity.